Hey everybody, welcome to Before College TV Live. This is another edition of Five Big Questions. And today I have the privilege to hang out with Ted Fisk, also known as Edward Fisk. He is the world famous, world famous author of the Fisk Guide to Colleges. He is a former editor of the New York Times. And Ted has just he, he's seen so much. He's done so much writing. He also is an international traveler. He studied education in Southeast Asia, New Zealand, South Africa. He's published several other books with his teammate, partner, Helen Ladd, who's a professor at Duke University. And Ted is just an extraordinary individual, someone who I love hanging out with. I've had the privilege of actually being able to break some bread to share some meals with Ted. Everybody, please welcome Ted Fisk. Great to see you. This Thank is you. pretty Next, dramatic. Can, can we, on that note, can we stop and go home? <laughs> yeah, you want, it's gonna be downhill from now on. <laughs> oh, I know, I know. It, it might feel that way, but boy, there we have a mountain to climb and I am excited to be here with you because I, I have a ton of respect for you. I don't know if I've ever told you that. Have I ever said that? No, that, that comes as real news. <laughs> but, but fortunately, I'm sitting down. <laughs> I, I, we we always have we always have a nice time. Uh, our publishers, uh, we share the same publisher, Source Books, when it comes to the Fisk Guide. So uh, Ted and I have had the chance to to hang out and and actually like you know have dinners together and see each other at at, at NACAC. And uh, it's really been a joy. It's something I you, really you are a, a valued professional colleague. Well, look at that. Wow. I'll take that. Now we should go. <laughs> you put that on the back of your next book. <laughs> it's good to go downhill from, from here. Yeah. So, you know, I, I sit across the table from you and, and you, you share such wonderful stories and you, you really have lived and continue to live so many stories and lives. And I'm curious to go back all the way to when you first started dreaming. Um, you know, when you were a kid, a young boy, a young boy on the, uh, walking the streets of, where were you a young boy walking the streets? Uh, Philadelphia. <laughs> a young boy wandering the streets of Philadelphia, all full of, uh, you know, dreams and, and maybe, maybe a little bit mischievous. Uh, did you have a dream? You make me sound like Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> right, I wonder, I think it's a compliment, but you know. with your kite and the string yeah. and the yeah. storm, <laughs> just don't touch the key. It's bad, bad for you. It's wisdom. That's good advice. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, did you, did you have a dream starting off? Was there something that you really wanted to do? And 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 I'm curious to know if you're doing it. No, it. it I just kind of. Um, uh, take things as they come. And uh, I, I really had sort of an exceptional upbringing, but I, uh, the, the one thing that I always did as a kid was journalism. I mean, I was the editor of every newspaper that I ever came in contact with, a high school magazine and college newspaper and so forth that. So um, I always kind of wanted, kind of gravitated toward journalism. I can remember as a kid with, when I was editor of the high school magazine, uh, I just love the the experience of go going to the print shop and watching the first copy of it come off the off the press, and it was just just sort of the visceral tactile sensation of you've written something and then you know there it is coming out of out of this machine. And I used to love when I was working at the New York Times. I started out covering religion, and then I became the education editor. But I used to love every once the New York Times at that time was still published and printed in Times Square. So, uh -huh. I mean, you can imagine you're running a factory on West 43rd Street, 100 yards from Times Square, uh, with this business where you're create, you're manufacturing this product and you have to have the product come out exactly on time or you lose that business forever. So you had trucks going into Times Square and getting filled up with the, the thump of big, big, uh, yeah, bundles of newspapers, and then they drive off. And I just loved whenever we would be going to staying, whenever I'd be staying late and going to the theater or something, or having dinner in New York, I, I would love just to, to go by. And that was when the trucks came and you had this, 
visceral sense. Of, it was it was wonderful. I just loved it. Yeah, it sounds magical. Yeah. And I love I love that part. I I love that you've been a part of of journalism through just you know it's it's almost the Gutenberg press in terms of just the internet and how things have evolved. And uh, I was I was trying to figure out where you know I wanted to find your first article because um, I was doing a little digging. And I don't know if this is it. I tried so hard. This is January nineteenth of nineteen sixty seven. Okay. And then this is the story. Let me show you. There's another story here. This is the actual story. Polls get view. Poll gets views of churchgoers. Do you remember that story? No, I don't. But I've been writing for the New York Times for three years at that point. Oh my gosh! I did yeah. some horrible research. Yeah, I, I started as a news clerk there. I was essentially a glorified copy boy, just you know, taking. Uh, Carrying a copy around the news newspaper, really around the around the newsroom, and then I became a, a reporter. And I, I, when I went into journalism, I, I thought if I want to go, if I'm going to be a journalist. I want to work for the New York Times, which was the best paper, right? And I, so I took a, a copy boy job just so I could sort of get into within the institution. And I figured I either I would get promoted, or if they didn't find it in, in, in their, in their, uh, they didn't think I ought to be promoted. Maybe I should find another profession, right. but it worked. I became the, uh, uh, a reporter within a year, which was actually quite, quite fast at that point. And I, I have a degree in theology. So I had, that was my other sort of background. And I, I'd worked at a church in Harlem for a while. Uh -huh. uh, and so, uh, they assigned me to the religion desk and, it was a great time to be a religion reporter because it was right after the Second Vatican Council, and you was all the turmoil of and the and the priests and nuns leaving, you know, leaving the church and getting married, and all these doctrinal disputes. And I used to have to go to, to uh, Rome every summer or two because I, I figured out God goes to Rome in the summer, usually October, <laughs> which is when the tourists have left, but or at least a lot of them, uh, but the weather is still spectacular. Yeah, and so and so there was that, and I was essentially watching a medieval institution take on the Enlightenment, modernism, the New Left, all of, and and the Protestant Reformation all at once. And so that was a great story. I was always writing leads like for the first time since Martin Luther, blah 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 blah. Yeah, uh, oh, yeah. and. And then after that, everything, uh, no pun intended, but sort of petered out. And um, there was, um, it was the rise of all the cults and the sects and, you know, the children of God. And I, you know, I went on a kidnapping where they, with some parents <laughs> rescued their kid from this. You, you were there? You you were part of the rescue? Yeah, with a photographer. A yeah, with a photographer. Yeah. Was it a van? I imagine a van. A van? No, a van they just the sliding door, and they grabbed the. No, it was just a family sedan, and they took him down, down in the middle town, Connecticut. And but anyway, so that was a very different kind of uh, of, um, of journalism because the the first period where I was watching all these structural changes in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, then this one I was just it, my what I knew about church history. I mean, I had a degree. Uh, it was very helpful, so I could put things in the perspective of four or five hundred years. With covering all the sects, the job was essentially to try to uh, communicate the th the sort of religious experience mm -hmm. that people were having today to to the reader. So it was a very different kind of of writing, and it posed its own challenges because if you have a bunch of people sitting around in a circle. Um, speaking in tongues it's a little hard to be inconspicuous as a journalist you're you're the observer you know you don't want to participate so mm -hmm. that that you but you develop techniques for doing that yeah anyway, it was a lot of fun yeah, i mean you were in the middle you were in the middle of it all and uh, yeah. and then, then i got to be very good at dealing with us with people who held firmly to dogmatic beliefs 
religion. So they saw they needed an education editor. <laughs> they thought, hey, he can probably handle education. So. Did you want to do that? Was that something that excited you at the time, or yeah. was it yeah. like? Yeah, I mean, it, it, journalistically, it, it, there were in the news weekly parlance you call back of the book sections, but I had a, a, a subject I was talking, it, it became, you know, I became pretty knowledgeable about it. And, uh, so it was in very, very similar to covering religion and covering education. Uh, not a lot of date of store of breaking stories for the next day's news. Um, but uh, yeah, but you also got to report, and it's just not just on events and conventions and resolutions, uh, uh, but on ideas and uh, sort of theolo theological trends or educational trends. So it was really very stimulating, and uh, and it was it was anyway, it, it was great, great fun. Yeah, that was you started as the education editor. Was that in 1981, or was that uh, the 70s? Uh, yeah. Right. So you did that for, for quite some time. And, and I think, yeah. I don't know if there were a lot of education editors at the time who were doing what you were doing. Um, when you were in that role, there has to be a day, there has to be an event, there has to be something that was pretty jarring to you. Um, you know, somebody getting really upset or uncomfortable, and you really having to dig in and defend your position or change your position. Is there a day, an event that you can remember that sticks out during your your time at the time? Well, there were there are a lot of really fascinating stories. I mean, I, I when the one of the stories was when Paul when Pius VI, the Pope, flew to Istanbul or AKA Constantinople, right. and it was the first time in a thousand years to to visit the Ecumenical Patriarch, who was the head of all the Orthodox churches. So this was the this was the first time in a thousand years that the uh, the leaders of the Eastern and the Western churches had met. So that was kind of fun. I, I flew on the Pope's plane to, to go to that. So it That's was kind neat. of like an ecclesiastical Air Force One. Oh, it's interesting. Did you did you take? Was there any like Pope souvenirs? I, I do have a, a wine glass yeah, a souvenir. He gave the all the reporters got a, a wine glass with a papal uh, coat of arms on it. I still have it. Right. I can go in the other room and get it and show it to you if you really wanted to see it. Oh, the, the, maybe, you'll, maybe you'll just take my word for it. No, no. If you have a cup that you got while on. All right, hold it. This is great. I don't think we've ever seen Ted's Pope wine glass that he was he got as, as a reporter covering uh, the Pope's visit to Istanbul, Constantinople. I'm going to sing. But he, look at this. This is fascinating. <laughs> I love this. So that's the glass. You got this. Is it right there. You, can you see can you see the papal coat of arms there? It says God is good. Uh it's it's <laughs> made in Rome. 19 that's it. So you got that's so cool. So it's it's not exactly the uh, status nice. of a relic. You know, but, you know, I mean, it's, that's not like a piece of the true cross or something. But, but, but hey, cool. you know, you know, do what you can. How many people have, have uh, you know, flown flown on the plane with the Pope? You know, um, a few oh. hundred. Yeah, <laughs> a few hundred. Of, you got a real number. Well, journalists, and the, it was fun watching the Italian journalists because they, 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 of course, the ones who cover the the Vatican. Yeah. You know, they, of course, almost worship the Pope. So to be sort of able to ask questions to the Pope uh, is yeah. just a lot of fun. For so on the plane, it was it, I was watching the Pope, but it was more, almost more fun watching the journalists, the Italian <laughs> journalists. Yeah. What, how many rows away from the Pope were you? Oh, you I, don't know. I was in the seat. He came down the aisle. Oh, uh, he came down the aisle to go to the bathroom? Yeah. <laughs> well, I I didn't I didn't ask him that. <laughs> no, but did he come down the aisle? Me. <laughs> I want to be, you know, with all being respectful. And I didn't know because you're sitting in the seat. When I see someone come down the aisle when I'm in an airplane, I think, you know, it's their time to take a break. Well, he wasn't dressed like a flight attendant. <laughs> <laughs> he was dressed, was he dressed like the Pope? Yeah, he was dressed like the Pope, you know, white robe and all that. Did he have the head, the head pieces as well? No, no, he just had a skull cap. Okay. That's a, that's a whole, well, that's not what we came to talk about, but boy, that sure is interesting. Um, 
<laughs> right, I know. How does this relate? But but this was the this was the stuff before the college guide piece. Was there any college related stuff that really that that was jarring or shook you or a president or admin who said, "Listen, Ted, you know, I got a big problem with you." I'm sure that's happened over the years, but um, you know, when when oh, you yeah, well, I got I got banned from the White House. Interesting. Why? Uh, well, Richard Nixon had a um I could show you something here. I've got the, I've got yeah, let's show me, show me. I want to see. Yeah, all, right. Oh, cool. all right, so some background. Richard Nixon, when he was president, uh, most most there's a church right across. It, oh, actually, it's a church where Trump went and held the, the Bible in front up right. upside down. But you know, uh, anyway, it's uh, it's called the Church of the Presidents, and it's way way back. I don't know. Go back to George Washington. Presidents of the United States went and, and worshipped there. Uh, Richard Nixon had a different approach, so he thought rather he was going to God, he was going to have God come to him. And so he used to have white uh, church services in the White House, uh, in the East Room. And so I did an article for the New York Times Sunday Magazine about a White House church service, which was you know, kind of, it was, it was fun, it was different. And so I went to one, and um, one of the points of having the White House church services was, uh, they weren't strictly religious. Um, I mean, they were services, but um, they uh, they had, there, there was some politics there. It was, a, it was a chance to invite your followers and friends and potential donors and so forth to come and 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 be in the White House. And so I, I mentioned this in the article that there were some religious motivations to this, uh, to these church services. Uh, I mean, political motivation. And um, anyway, apparently, and it was a good article, actually. I reread it a while ago, and it was I, I really liked it. But it, the White House didn't like it. Um, and so there there was a memo, and I found this in, in, a, in a book. Uh, it, was, it was mentioned in a book. I didn't know this at the time. But this is a... Um, Oops, I keep putting the wrong one. Hold on. I don't want to get okay. you there. Okay. Right. There's glare. So what is it? Here's it says the White House, Washington, administratively confidential with a note <laughs> uh, from H.R. Haldeman. You, some people may remember he was the chief of staff. August 10th, 1971. Memorandum for Alex Butterfield, who was an assistant in, in the uh, White House at the time from H.R. Haldeman. Here's the text of the memo. It is absolutely imperative that it clearly be understood by all concerned that Edward B. Fisk, the religion editor of the New York Times, is not to be invited to any White House church services again in the future under any circumstances whatsoever. <laughs> so, anyway. That is... That is that. So <laughs> I, I, I made it on the Richard Nixon's enemies list, which I... I, it's a badge of honor. I, you know. Look at that. Wow. Yeah. That's so, a, you never went again, I right? You never interviewed anybody else who's, who was banned from the White House. No, I mean, there's, I'm you, getting a lot you, of bonuses here. Yeah, <laughs> you, 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 you operate in, not, in higher circles, I guess. <laughs> Did you that know. upset you getting rejected by the president? Well, I didn't know it at the time. It was only when this book came out uh, with uh, about Alex Butterfield's, uh, the, um, papers. Uh, he, he was an aide who left who left fairly early before the big scandals. But it, there I was in this book, and they, he had discovered this. Uh, he talked a lot about Nixon, Nixon's uh, personality yeah. def defects, uh, and this was an example. And he and he and he <clears throat> printed the memo in the appendix to the book. So I didn't know about it then. I, I, I knew there was one time when I wanted to go back to the White House church service because Billy Graham was preaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had interviewed Billy Graham a few days before that. And they wouldn't let me in. They wouldn't give me a pass. Oh. And I even asked Billy Graham if he would put in a word for me. And he, he, he said he would, but it didn't help. Because you're so, banned. But, so I was banned, but it took about 30 years before I knew that I was banned. Right. I wonder if it's better to have it, you know, to have to wait 30 years, you know, then you have to deal with the hurt feelings and, you know, he's gone anyway, cause he was banned. So uh, I'll, have to give, I'll have to give you some thought to that, Harlan. I can't give you. 
I was, I was hoping to get an answer on that one. So as the education editor, you're in the middle of schools providing just an enormous amount of information, just the whole, the whole landscape of college and higher ed started to change. And you felt that the consumer needed better information. Yeah. Right? What happened was this was the early 80s. I mean, it's been going for close to 40 years now. <clears throat> um, the last of the baby boomers were, were finishing up with college. Uh, because baby boomers were born from 46 to 64. So they were finishing up in the late 70s, early 80s. And so the number of high school graduates was <clears throat> declining and colleges were worried, <clears throat> a lot of colleges were worried about filling up their classes. So they became very aggressive in their marketing. <clears throat> now, as we look back on this, it's, it all seems very kind of quaint. It was four color brochures and mailboxes and, and videos, remember them, you know, videotapes. It was a, it's an old technology that yeah. you, you can't work with these days. <clears throat> but anyway, so the colleges were doing a lot of, uh, of, of aggressive marketing. And, and I had a lot of fun covering this. I wrote an article for Atlantic Monthly about it, then, then called Atlantic Monthly. <clears throat> um, and because the colleges were doing some wild stuff. My, I, one of my favorite stories is there was a school in Indiana which is, you know, flat. <clears throat> and there was a huge rainstorm and um, a, an enormous puddle formed in the middle of the campus green. And so an alert person in the PR office went out and took a picture <laughs> of this lake. <laughs> it was half an inch thick, but it was a lake <laughs> that had formed. And, and then you got some students to sit around the edge of it. And by and large, that and you know, that that picture appeared in a view book the next <laughs> year. But unbeknownst to the editors of the of the yearbook, if you looked carefully at the couple of the students who were assembled to sit by the side of this non lake, they were smoking a joint. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and um, so I don't know, but it ran in the college view book. Right. Uh, so I don't know. My guess is it probably helped boost applications that year. I, I don't know. But anyway, they were, they were they were doing all these sorts of things. So it was a lot of fun to write about it. And I did it several times. It was on the front page of the Times. I did it in the business section and so on. But then it occurred to me and my publisher at the, the, the Times had a, bu a book publisher at the time, Times Books, it's logical. And we decided we somebody needed to come in on the side of this consumer to to cut through all this propaganda, one sided propaganda, which was coming from the colleges. And so that's how the Fisk Guide was born. It started out as the New York Times Selective Guide to Colleges, uh -huh. uh, but uh, it became pretty controversial, uh, which is another whole long story. <clears throat> um, but because uh, I was I was saying things in the book that I couldn't say in the newspaper, you wouldn't say <clears throat> some students say that the dormitories are <laughs> palatial. Others say they are like hellholes or, <clears throat> or some people say the food is great. Or some people don't. I mean, <clears throat> it just wasn't what you do in a college guide. You want the purpose of the fist guide is to is a is to talk about the culture, the institutional personality of the schools and to convey that. Right. And it's not something you would put in a newspaper. And so anyway, Times took its name out and I got a lot of publicity and the book. And so the rest is history. And then eventually people just kept referring to it as a fist guide. So it became eponymous. And uh, Right. Yeah. What part of writing the guide Let's let's go back to when you started writing it, because I want to ask you this as a two part question. When you started writing the Fisk Guide, what part of it gave you the most joy when it was in its earliest stages, when you first started putting it out? Well, I, I think the most this may sound a little strange, but I think the most the, the most interesting thing was to realize and to be able to write about the incredible diversity of American higher education. 
I mean, if you look at higher universities in Europe, first of all, they're mainly universities. You don't have a lot of small liberal arts colleges, but you tend to go to the university, to an urban university near you. I mean, that's sort of the pattern. Now it, it's getting a little more, more complicated, but in the United States, the, um, that's not the, the, the way universities were founded. They didn't grow up around big cities. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite, because a lot of the, the origins of American higher education, they were it was religious denominations, and what they wanted to, is to get students out in the boonies so they could so they could you know, teach them their own particular mm -hmm. uh, religious philosophy. So Cambridge, where when Harvard was founded in 1836, Cambridge was was a sub well it wasn't even a suburb it was it was a separate separate city from Boston. Princeton's still out in the boonies. New Haven is, you know, not near anything. Yeah. So it was, um, uh, <laughs> my wife just walked in. She, she wanted to see. I don't know. This is, uh, this is what we get. This is the beauty of being able to do this. Yeah. This yeah. Because <laughs> right. I've heard uh, so many wonderful things. Like, oh, you were talking about how they would. They would there's an incredible diversity of American right. education. So you've got everything from, single sex two year colleges in the boonies to world class urban universities some private some public uh research universities you have evangelical schools you have jesuit schools you have hbcus there's all these kinds of choices of different different types and the the risk uh there was a ri editorial risk of once you've written about the 17th small liberal arts college in Ohio, where the faculty often invite the students to their homes for dinner, uh, they would all sound alike, you know, Kenyon, Denison, Ohio, Wesley, how do you tell them apart? And, and that was a risk because I didn't know what the answer to that was. But the fact is that even colleges that look alike uh, on the surface in terms of enrollment size and programs and so are, are very different. They have their own culture. They have their own histories, especially. And, and they can, no school can ever get away from its history. It's, it's just part of its personality. And so that was fun was to, to, to re realize there was this incredible diversity. So there's, you know, lots of interesting th stories to tell about American colleges and universities. And then to, uh, and then to, to, to boil it down and, and to write an essay, you know, anywhere from 1,000 to 2,500 words, conveying that unique personality, that unique institutional culture of, of, the, of the schools. And the, cu the, the, the culture persists. <clears throat> you know, I mean, I, I, even the, the, the men who go to Vassar, after Vassar was a woman's college, right. then, it, then it started accepting men. But the interests in, of, of the men who went to Vassar were not all that different from the interests of the women who were there before. I mean, it's, 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 it's designed for you know, certain uh, kinds of people who gravitate there. And uh, so that was fa fascinating to realize. Yeah. And when you were when you're researching these schools and trying to uncover the cultures and the stories and the histories, did you have to physically go to each of these schools or would you use your surveys and reporting no, to capture them? Had, we got 325 schools, so I can't, there's no way I could. Road trip. Road it's trip. A, it, it, <laughs> but, and, and also, you know, if I visit a school, I don't, I get a fairly distorted view of it, you know. Which, I mean, that's interesting. because yeah, I mean, a couple of future Rhodes Scholar students and see right. the numbers program. So yeah, yeah, I have to watch that. Uh, that's, for, you know, Ted, I wanted to interject because for parents and students who are visiting schools, you know, that question of if you want to learn about a school, well, you have to visit the school. Uh, but now because of COVID and what's happening right now and also the cost of visiting schools. And also if you visit a school, you might get a skewed perception of the school. Um, you know, you clearly have been able to get a sense of- Yeah, the, well, the, but a, a parent visiting a school is very different than the editor of a college guide visiting the school. Yeah. They're trying to impress the editor. They are, they're not necessarily, well, they're trying to impress press students and their parents. It's a very different yeah. 
thing. But you know, I I think visiting a school is really terrific. Yeah. And especially if you can spend an overnight at the school. I mean, within 24 hours, you can really nail the culture and the personality of a school. Just do you think by someone being, should go to the classes? Should like during the 24 students, hours? What do you say? Going to a class, looking who's sitting with whom in the in the dining hall. Uh, just being there physically, it doesn't take very long. You get a sense of whether you, be, whether, whether you belong. Uh, I, it, is, it can almost be sort of eerie sometimes. I mean, I say if, to parents, if you're driving on a tour and you go through the gates of the school and the kid turns and says, I don't like it, <laughs> you might as well just do a Yui and, uh, yeah. and, and go on because it's, I don't know, I, don't ask me to explain why this. There's something subliminal about it. Right. But, but these, uh, but there is the thing to do is to look for this personality, and and it evolve. It, it, it personalities can evolve, but um, they don't change. And I guess the most dramatic example of this, bear with me a little bit. Yeah. Was University of Pennsylvania, and which is an Ivy League school, you know, one of the top schools in the country, and. We were. I was. We get. We get questionnaires from the administration, and then we get questionnaires from students. So that's the basic method. Not not just visiting. Although I do visit some, but uh, and so we were reading. This is for the first edition. Oops. Uh, we were reading the first edition, and I was reading this this the questionnaires from the students at, at Penn, and uh, there was sort of an. I, um, an undercurrent of anti-intellectualism, which ran through these questionnaires, which was sort of, I couldn't quite understand. So I put the, put it aside for a while and, and did some interviewing. There was a, I talked to provost at Penn, who's a friend of mine. And um, what, it, what, what I discovered was that the, the, the Penn was, was founded by Benjamin Franklin, which, I know. Uh, and the even though I grew up in Philadelphia, I didn't realize that the liberal arts traditions at Penn um, are, were really pretty much post-World War II. Over the first couple hundred years, Penn uh, built its reputation as the first medical school, the, the Wharton School, business school, first psychological clinic, and so forth. And uh, even to, to this day, it's it's a leader in uh, in service learning and service service research. So Penn always had this tradition of um, uh, pragmatic knowledge. Uh, this isn't this isn't it's not just technical, but it's that the. But then I, what I realized was this went back to Benjamin Franklin, who was sort of the ultimate American pragmatist. Uh, and he he valued. I mean, he was a scientist. He valued knowledge and all, but he always kind of thought of, of knowledge not as an end in itself in some vague way, but as a uh, as having practical use. And so it makes sense that over this two hundred years, Penn would 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 follow in this sort of tradition, uh, respect for the pragmatism of knowledge. But, but then the idea, and this is what, what I found so staggering, the idea that the values of some guy who died more than two centuries ago are showing up unsolicited in the responses on a questionnaire to kids in the early 80s was just staggering. But what it, to me, it was the ultimate example of the of the of the consistency of a culture and a tradition. Yeah, uh, that uh, that really makes uh, uh, American higher education so so fascinating. So to answer your original question way way back before I started pontificating, um, it's that's probably the most interesting thing is to is to uh, to assume that there's this incredible diversity and then have a chance to write about it. Yeah capturing the 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 essence the culture exactly. the, the the feeling of each institution and the yeah. idea that each one has a distinct flavor and feel yeah. that can extend all the way back to the founders yeah. uh, that's something i've really thought about and i think it's something that most people don't think about because the way college is designed right now is about scarcity 
uh, it's about scarcity and fear. Yeah. People are afraid they're not going to get in and that there aren't enough spots. Yeah. So the focus becomes how can I work my hardest to get in so that I can get there as opposed to how can I look at schools through a lens of what do I want and what aligns with me and my purpose? Yeah, and the, and the, the corollary of all this is that there are dozens of schools out there, literally dozens, that will be a really good fit for any particular student. So what I tell the students is, you know, the chances of you being successful in your college search are, are, are huge. Um, they're in, you know, because the odds are in your favor because there is this incredible diversity. Right. Uh, so you may not get into the schools you think you want to get into, but uh, but there are plenty of other goods out there. So I say, you know, you will be successful even if you don't necessarily get into the school that you think uh, you that you think you want. I love I love that, and I I really I have a similar uh, approach of just you know our students, they're the dream makers, they're the creators of their of their future. And it's not a school that's going to be the thing that's gonna make them or break them. Yeah. So they need to approach this next phase of their life yeah. being really self-directed, which is really hard for an 18 year old or a 19 year old who's still you know, discovering their likes and dislikes. When it comes to a student going through this process, asking specific questions that can really speak to uh, the the essence of the school or how a student's going to really be successful or what they should look for. Are there a couple questions or a few questions that you encourage students or parents to ask when going through this process that can really distill what they want down to uh, the best parts? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that in a, in a big general way. I mean, one question I, I encourage people to ask is who's going to teach me next year? Yeah as a as a freshman or as a as a sophomore because that'll give you I mean, one of the important aspects of culture of a, of a school is what how do you how do the students relate to the faculty members do you, i mean there's plenty of good schools where you don't see a full professor until you're until you declare a major how can and, that be a good school i mean well, i'm just kind of pushing back well, I'll say, there's a, a, a well-regarded school let's put right. it that Right, but, that, but, and then one of the but one of the things you when you ask that question of fit, yeah, not what's the best school, but what's the best school for me, you know, which is another whole whole discussion, um, that uh, that one of the key aspects of that is what's my relationship going to be to the faculty, um, and uh, so yeah, who's you, you, the, the, the other than what schools do with SAT averages, but the uh, the most corrupt statistic is faculty student ratio. So don't ever pay any attention to what colleges say about a faculty student can ratio. There's a really different way to calculate it. I mean, do you, yeah. but so uh, what are the chances that I'm going to be seeing a, a senior faculty member early on? Because right. uh, that says a lot about the culture of the school. Uh, one of the things we've started doing a number of years ago was paying a lot of attention to freshman experience, special programs. And a lot of colleges have moved toward creating programs, which for at least one program, well, they're still students are still taking the general education, uh, where they, they uh, consciously expose them to high level uh, scholarly work for at least one of their freshman courses. And I, I think that those are really good ideas and a lot of colleges do it. And it's something to ask, you know, ask for um, uh, when, you're, uh, when, when you're looking at a college, do you have this sort of thing? Yeah, that was a, another question I was gonna ask when it comes to the trends, uh, you know, looking at the first guide that came out in 1982 versus the 2021 guide, uh, when, when, we would take those schools, if we take the schools and kind of compare one to another over the course of, of almost 40 years, are, are there certain trends, things yeah. that have jumped out most recently that yeah. you can highlight? Yeah, there, now, there's been some evolution. I might just, uh, uh, as an aside, the, the fact that there is this, these, these cultures and institutional personalities persist is a reason that 
I mean, right now, as we prepare the next edition, we're talking about campus life and dormitories and stuff. And a lot of that's going to be outdated by the time the book comes out. <clears throat> so, uh, but the fact is that the culture is going to persist. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying to readers, and I will in the introduction once it gets written, is that um, even though what we're saying here about some of the statistics and some of the living things about dorms and so forth are, 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 are not accurate at the moment, that once we get through this, we hope within a year or two, um, things will go back to normal and that institutional culture is going to reassert itself. So that's right. an active phase, but I, but I think it's um, everything indicates that that's, that's true. I think in terms of themes that have evolved, um, back in the 90s, there was a lot more concern about campus security. Right. So we started asking questions about that. Um, more recently, there was a lot of concern about sexual assault. And so we started asking questions about what programs did the, the colleges have to, to, com to combat, uh, uh, combat that. Um, there's also in the last few years been much more concern about the, the value of socioeconomic diversity, that if you're gonna get a good education, you really have to be with, do so within the context of yeah, of a diverse, of diverse group of, of fellow students. Uh, we started reporting the percent of Pell Grant students who are at a particular school. Um, and then just in the last year or so, the whole issue of systemic racism and systemic uh, inequality has become a huge issue. So I'm guessing that there, we're going to be seeing some evolution in what the colleges and what the students have to say about that as we move forward. So the basic themes are, are persistent, but but these social and other issues uh, assert themselves from time to time, and we try to be sensitive to them. So do you, when you're looking at the next edition, do you do a survey of the, the college administrators and say, what are some of the other issues that have, uh, you know, come to come to the surface, or do you as an editor, as just an independent editor say, you know, we got to include this. No, I think we have a sense of the, of, of the issues that are evolving. I mean, we're not talking about uh, Gnostic issues of any sort. Right, right. And, and you're still actively involved. Like I've seen you at NACAC and that's the National Association of, of College Admissions Counselors. And I see you in, there's this, so if people don't know, I mean, they're, it, there are hundreds of schools. I mean, it is like, as far as the eye can see, there are little booths and tables and you have some of the most influential admissions officers who are there and you have people who maybe you didn't know or do know. And I mean, it's just, it's just a fascinating place. And, and then Ted is running around. You, you run, I've seen you run, running <laughs> around to each different school to fill in the blank. No, I hop. I hop. I hop. I don't run. You hop and you, you put on your 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 uh, your bunny yeah, ears and your tail, right. yeah. <laughs> and you hop around the hall. But you you really are you know it's, it's fun to watch you. Do you <laughs> still have, well, you know you you've got a lot of passion for this. I mean, it's 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 interesting to me to see that you you seem to have a love for this. Is that just an illusion, or do you really? still have a passion for this and, and well, do you still enjoy this? For all the reasons I've said, yeah, higher education and colleges are really fascinating. And I'm a journalist. I like, like to run about, run, uh, you know, to write about it. But um, I also uh, yeah, have a huge amount of respect for higher education. Yeah. Uh, and so it's fun, but it's also it's important. And it's almost scary sometimes when, when a reader, I mean, I have a sense that I'm, try, that I'm doing something useful. That I'm, I'm really basically trying to help people by informing them and, and talking about what really counts in a college and what, what 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 doesn't. And it's almost scary when somebody will come up to me and say, Gee, you know, I went to name a college uh, because of what you said in the fist guy. And I, uh oh, good. I don't I sure I want that responsibility. And I, and I hope I wasn't the only reason that you went yeah. to a school. But on the other hand, I, I like the idea of being able to suggest, to, which happens a lot. People will say, yeah, 
uh, especially with with women and singles and uh, all women's colleges. Uh, and I have a huge respect for all women's colleges because co most colleges are really pretty sexist, um, male chauvinistic places, and men tend to dominate airwaves, and women tend to do better in, in seminars and all. And and there's a there's a lot of sexism in the, in the structure of higher education. I mean, just look at the male female ratios on faculties, especially in the in the sciences. But the women's colleges don't have this. Women in schools like Wellesley and Smith and Holyoke and Bryn Mawr. I mean, yeah, Swarthmore, uh, Bryn Mawr. Um, they really they really know how to empower women. And so I always say to, to women when I'm talking to to people about about colleges, you know, don't dismiss um, the all women's college as an option because you know you you be in an environment for four years where and it, it, they're they're not fishbowls they're not you know, test tubes anymore. There's plenty of social life. Uh, right. You're going to be spending four years where where people expect you to perform, uh, and they're real. And so every once in a while, somebody will say, you know, I never thought I know. One woman, she, she, it never occurred to me, but she was swinging through Massachusetts and uh, it was in uh, Northampton and took a look at Smith and ended up there and it was a terrific match. So um, I'm not sure how I got started on this. But. I, I think it's, it's it, that I love stuff like that. I mean, yeah. I, I don't hear people say that. And also I think it's interesting that you have this very strong uh, belief system that those schools are more equal or at least empowering for women and and the sexism piece I mean, if, you, if you look even going back to the 19th century uh the the, the women the all women, the women's colleges have always been very strong in science and you know back in the late 19th century the the, the original seven sisters they were the only places where women could study science and they basically turned out and, and then my wife's an economist and, who went to wellesley and wellesley turned had her generation of female economists, almost all of them came from Wellesley um, because they, they, they said, you know, you can compete. You're just as good as anybody else. And they, mm -hmm. uh, and she helped the head of the department, helped nurture them and uh, uh, wrote references and so forth. And so mm -hmm. I, the one I, I, I liked, if somebody says that, yeah, I, I never would have occurred to me to look at this kind of college before I read in the in the Fisk guide. And then that that I take as a compliment. Yeah, I, I just like the fact that for, for some people I've just opened some doors. That's very satisfying. Well, it's very unusual to have a guide that is so large to reflect the the deeper culture and the meaning and knowing the legacy you know hearing that the founding principles and how this started is something that you can still see today and knowing that when you read the guide you're getting a, a really insightful look at not just the school today but the culture that has carried over and, and that's something that you don't usually find um so when students are looking for their places i'm a big advocate of you got to find your places you know, places where you sweat, play, pray, live, learn, lead, love, and work. So when you're going through the guide, thinking where are my places and aligning with those things that are important to you. I just have two questions and you've been so generous with your time um, and I'm, I'm so grateful for it. There are a lot of schools that aren't in the FISC guide. And, and I know you've, you've spoken about that before. If a school isn't in the guide, um, explain that, you know, that can still be a wonderful, a wonderful school. Um, you know, because I think some people don't always see that or understand that. Yeah, well, that's true. I mean, there are 20, what are there, 2,300 four-year colleges and the, you know, back BA grading colleges, uh, and we've only got room for about 325. So, you know, we, we have our principles for, for selecting which ones, but the, the fact that the school is not in the guide doesn't mean, doesn't say anything about the quality or, or the lack of quality. Yeah. And you, you you might have, for example, a school in, in New England where there are lots of small liberal arts colleges that might have a tough time getting into the guide, whereas a comparable school in Texas where there are only about four <laughs> um, right. would be in a much better position. So we try to have geographic diversity is one of the criteria that we use. So 
Uh, so it's arbitrary, uh, and admit, admittedly, but we try to we try to have certain principles that we follow in, in picking. And but I, often people will write to me and say, "How come this school that my daughter is interested in isn't a guide?" And I have to I write back and say, "You know, it's space constraints. It's, my my wife already thinks the book is too big and too heavy, uh, and gives me a lot of grief over that." That was one of my questions. I, I have a question. How many books, how many fist guides can you carry at once? Uh, I've never, I've never tried. And, uh, do you have a hand truck? I was going to say, can we, I would say just carrying it. I know you've showed us a lot of things in your home. This might be a great thing. This could also be a good TikTok, seeing just how many you can carry. Yeah, or how many. <laughs> Yeah, how many fist guys does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> this could be this could be a good. Well, you know, when I'm when I'm in the neighborhood, when this COVID thing lifts, I can come over. I know you've invited me for dinner many times, or did I invite myself? I'm sorry, I didn't. The last part. I said I I said either you invited me to dinner or I invited myself to yeah. your place. Well, <laughs> you're welcome anytime. <laughs> Socially distanced, of course. So very socially distanced, like from Chicago to uh, to North Carolina. <laughs> I yeah, guess six, uh, six hundred miles. <laughs> that's that's a good social distance. Well, I'm just so thrilled to have you here, and and the Fisk guy is such a wonderful contribution, and you're such a, a passionate professional who I know really cares. And I just want to thank you for your time. And well, in um, my pleasure, we we share a wonderful publisher, and you're a good colleague, and. I enjoyed it. Well, Sourcebooks is wonderful. And I look forward to when this COVID thing, hey, you know, one other thing, this whole COVID thing, I know we didn't talk about COVID, but, um, you know, um, how do you think COVID will impact admissions, SATs, um, uh, financial situations on campuses, and um, the whole college process? <laughs> one last question. <laughs> that's, another, that's another huge discussion. I, I mean, I might see <laughs> We, with the next edition, it'll come out next May uh, and wow. June. We, uh, I, I'm not going to publish SAT ranges anymore. That's that's, that's big for news. For reasons that the, the numbers don't are, are totally unreliable, and we, I don't put un, what I know to be unreliable information in in the book because you have a combination of the growing number of test optional schools. You have the fact that. Um, a lot of, so many students don't have access um, to, to to the tests in the first place, so it gives them an unfair advantage to uh, students who do uh, if the schools take this all seriously. And um, and then there's just the um, debate over how unfair they are. Uh, the test it used to be that the SAT course was a way to sort of identify that diamond in the rough student, you know who who might be in a, in a not very good high school, you know. But now with test prep, it's, it's that, it doesn't mean any of that. It's, it's, it's made that, it made colleges useless, the test useless for, right. for that purpose. So at least for the next couple of years, we're just not gonna publish the test. The scores, I and mean, the ranges are readily available. You can go onto a college website, but I just don't wanna be in the business of publishing information that I know not to be reliable. It's a good editorial standard. Yeah. I, I, I respect that. I yeah. know these parents are, and the students are all freaked out because now, you know, they thought they had a better chance. And now because there's no test scores, um, you know, I think the person, the individual, the person who's really has their passions and who they are is, is going to be the thing that shines through and, and, and differentiates yeah. them. Would you, would you yeah. agree with that? And this is the, even before COVID, the colleges were moving toward less reliance on SAT scores because they understand now that, especially with all the test prep and the test optional, uh, that the the rigor of your high school curriculum and your grades are, are so much uh, more reliable measures of your of your academic uh, ability. And uh, so they they they're they're looking at those, and that's not going to change. Right. What about that kid who started off? Oh, sorry. Essentially, ways of confirming for colleges. Increasingly, they see the test scores as a way to confirm what the impression is from the test scores and uh, and the grade. I mean, from the uh, the the grades um, um, and the uh, rigor of the curriculum. 
What, what about that kid who started off with this, with like a 2.5, right? First semester, really struggled in high school, but now he's taking AP classes or she's taking AP classes and they're just kicking butt, but their GPA is like a three, four because they started off so terribly. Do you think that student should try to apply to those highly selective schools? Well, Roll the dice. The one thing college admissions often is they look for an upward trajectory. So some some colleges no longer even use freshman grades, uh, and so if, if you're coming on strong from, they're going to look at where you end up, uh, not necessarily. So the fact that you 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 you're doing much better later on is in your favor. But the 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 schools with fairly sophisticated admissions offices are are sensitive to this. You know, that's one of the things they look like. What's the projection? trajectory. The opposite would be they don't want, you, you can't goof off your senior year. <laughs> right. So a, a, a rapid decline at the end is going to work against you. They don't, they don't they want that. Upward trajectory will help you. Yeah. I like that idea. I think it gives hope to people who sometimes look at the, the statistics and the GPAs or the test scores and think I'm not good enough, but I think just trying is great. And um, I have many more questions, but I, I really want to just respect your time and you know we can continue this i was joking the longest we go is five hours um, um i'm not gonna go five we, we passed that long ago <laughs> <laughs> does it feel like that does yeah it, feel, it does well, I, don't, yeah. I don't like listening to myself talk that long oh you you know you you are uh Oh, I, I never learn anything new when I talk. <laughs> you don't, huh? Well, I sure did. And I know everybody watching did. And I want to give you a big thanks. And for anybody who's interested in getting a copy, the Fist Guide to Colleges is something that's been on everyone's shelf. Definitely check that out. This is Ted Fisk, a wonderful person, author, and uh, journalist, and grateful to have you here. Thanks, everybody, for being here for five big questions. I think it was more like 50 big questions. Uh, uh, be well, and, and thanks so much, Ted. Really appreciate it. Have a great Bye. afternoon. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks, thanks everybody.